thinking, folks, it is right on the hour for my clock, so I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Um, and to um, begin, I just want to make the general announcement that we do record these webinars, so our webinar will be recorded. Um, and it looks like we have lots of new participants in the room today, in our virtual room today. So if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and give us a sense of what your role is at your institution, it would be really lovely to have that um, in the chat window. So um, today's webinar from CCC OER is on the OER connection with dual enrollment. Um, and we'll talk just a few minutes about, the, just a second about that. Um, our agenda is we're going to do some brief introductions right now, including the intros you're sharing in the chat window. Uh, I'll give a brief interview, uh, a brief overview of CCC OER and our mission. We'll have four different present presentations today from a collection of really, really exciting presenters. Um, and then we'll do a panel discussion with those presenters. So I'm very, very excited to be able to do this. And then we'll have some brief announcements. So I'm very excited to do this webinar today. Um, and I hope that you all come on this journey with us and enjoy it as well. If you have questions about the presentation or about CCC OER or just about anything, go ahead and post those in the chat window and we will follow up. Okay, so first um, I want to do a brief introduction of who you will be hearing from today. Uh, we're not going to let them chime in to say hello um, because they will when they present, but I want to make sure everybody um, has the, that you know who you'll be hearing from. Um, so first, let me um, welcome from Austin Community College, Heather Surrett and Christy Carr, um, who will be joining us in just a moment to tell us all about their work with dual enrollment. Todd McCann is an English instructor who's joining us from Bay College in Michigan. Um, and we'll be hearing from Peter Shapiro and Nancy Webster from Florida State College at Jacksonville. And finally, from the Technical College System of Georgia. We'll be hearing from Nikki Stubbs, who is a vice president with CCC OER this year, and Robin Thomas, um, who is an English and Humanities instructor. And I want to say thank you to all of our presenters for taking on this presentation. We have never done a webinar on dual enrollment before, so I'm really excited to hear what folks have to say. Um, so as I mentioned, I want to do a brief intro of CCC OER and what we do. Um, CCC OER is a community of practice and our mission is really to expand the use and um, adoption of OER across many institutions, our members and others included. Um, we believe that through professional development like these webinars and through supporting one another, um, we can grow the use of open education across our community college systems. So um, to do that, we have a membership organization and a community of practice. We are a growing organization right now, which is very exciting. We have 81 members in 34 states, and you can kind of see where they are here. Um, and as just a brief welcome to our newest members, we have three new members just in the last month, which is very exciting for us. Um, and you can see who they are on the right-hand side of your screen. So I want to say welcome to our newest members, and if any folks are um, attending the webinar from our newest members, I would love it if you would just let us know you're here in the chat window. Okay, so dual enrollment, what is it and why are we so excited about it? Um, so the, the idea for this webinar comes out of the realization that more and more colleges are responsible for dual enrollment, which means having students at, who are at a high school level taking classes at the college or to offering classes in the college to or in the high school to students who need college credit. Um, and so these dual enrollment students are not students who are, who are accustomed to having purchased textbooks. So OER can play a really interesting role in serving these students. Um, and I'm really excited to see how folks do it because many of our member colleges have shared in the past year that they're, um, they have a rising number of students who are taking dual enrollment while they're in high school so that they can earn some credits towards college completion. Um, and so as 
as that demand grows, the need to support those students grows. And OER is one way that we can help them stay engaged in our colleges. So um, I'm really excited to hear about this because this is one of our biggest growing um, student enrollment here at Pierce College. So I was really thrilled that our members want to go here because I need to learn the same things that um, I hope we're all here to learn today. So without further ado, I would like to start with Todd McCann from Bay College. Um, so Todd is going to go ahead and unmute his screen and he'll just tell me when to set, send the slides forward. Hi everybody, how's it? Can you see and hear me? Looking good? Okay, we're ready to roll. Hi, I'm Todd uh, from Bay College. Um, we're way up in the upper peninsula of Michigan, uh, the part that tends to be forgotten way up there. Um, the part that's kind of looks like it's attached to Wisconsin, but it is part of Michigan. We are based in a small town, Escanaba, about 12,000 people. Um, we have a smaller campus about 50 miles west, Bay West. Um, the most recent stats I got are from fall 16, 1,935 students. I've been here um, 25 years, and the highest I can recall is about 2,500. And the lowest, I think, was just a few years ago at about 16, maybe 1,650. Uh, we are a small place, 45 uh, full-time faculties, um, between 90 and 100 adjuncts, I believe. Um, but like every, uh, elsewhere, dual enrollment has become a, an increasingly important part of what we do here. Um, as of fall 16, we had over 500 dual enrolled students, 28 and a half percent of our total enrollment. And those students are from 27 area high schools. Um, they're spread out in all sorts of classes, but most of them are in our gen ed classes which many of which um are oer so if you could go ahead uh quill Hi, Jacqueline. yes as far as our oer um activity we um were one of the colleges to receive the oer um or the Achieving the Dream OER Degree Initiative Grant. And as part of that, we developed a, an AA degree pathway. Um, we had um, begun some OER work before that, but uh, this grant gave us a push to complete a, an entire degree. Um, we have, uh, as it says there, 37 courses currently using OER and many sections because according to our full-time co uh, faculty contract um, all sections of the same class must use the same text now i don't think it's followed a um, hundred percent but pretty much um, for instance our english 101 and 102 courses use oer so that means all sections of english 101 and 102 use oer and um, since fall of 16, 7,600 students have been enrolled in OER courses and going with the average assumption of about 100 bucks um, per course they were spending on books equals about $760,000 that's been saved so far. Um, we do have, um, I guess you could call traditional dual enrollment uh, where students either come here and take our face-to-face -face classes, we have many online. Um, we do have, um, we do offer some courses at the high schools, about a half a dozen. I do, um, I do happen to do one of those. Um, we also have, I don't know if it's unique or not, but in this state called an early college program where select uh, schools um, participate. They have to be approved by the state and, uh, and after students graduate, seniors in high school graduate, they can come to the community college the next year for the full year uh, for free. So we have, uh, I'm not quite sure how many schools participating in that, but we have quite a, some of those students too. Um, new this year because of the increasing importance of dual enrollment, 
we hired or we created a new position, a dual enrollment coordinator. So this person um, coordinates all the scheduling. She advising, she advises dual enrolled students. Um, she handles uh, the early alerts for our dual, en uh, dual enrollment population. Um, as far as um, OER and dual enrollment, um, some schools uh, pay for the, their students' textbooks and some do not. Um, it's kind of a mixed bag. Um, some superintendents have specifically asked, um, so what do you have with OER? Because obviously their budgets are tight, even tighter than ours, and they can't afford to be spending $150 per book for a class of 25 students. Um, so yeah, that's the, the basics of all I had, uh, what I had to present. Um, small school, we're approaching the 30% dual enrolled um, status, and a growing percentage of them are using OER. So they're, um, we have no specific OER strategy connected to dual enrollment. It just, um, if they're in a class with, with happen to have, have an OER, then, then they're using OER. But again, I think the most interesting um, thing, as far as I'm, from my perspective, is how many student our uh, superintendents and administrators of our local high schools have been asking um, for OER courses because they just can't afford those expensive textbooks. Thank you so much, Todd. That's an interesting. Um take on that and I'm making a note of it to ask you about it when we're in our panel session. So um, just so folks are aware we're gonna um, do a panel discussion at the end of this time so if you have specific questions for Todd or any of our presenters please pop them in the chat window or save them for then be just because we have many presenters to get through. Um, Todd thank you very much. Sure. Okay, I'd like now to bring um, Nikki Stubbs and Robin Thomas um, forward and ask them to present a little bit about what they're doing at the Technical College System of Georgia. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Nikki. Um, so I'm the Educational Technology Coordinator, um, and I'm gonna basically give you a system perspective um, of um, what we're doing with dual enrollment um, and OER. And then Robin has uh, graciously joined us from one of our colleges. So Robin um, can give you more of a college level um, a approach to, um, to her specific classes for dual enrollment. Um, so Quill, do you wanna advance the slides? Um, or do you, okay, so here we go. So our overall system, actually has 22 colleges. Um, they're all individual colleges, the way that we're structured, but we're all part of the technical college system. Um, and we have actually 88 locations throughout Georgia. So we cover um, north to south, east to west. So there's pretty much, um, in those eight um, students have access to at least one of our campuses. Um, for, to give you an idea of size, our total unduplicated students for this uh, this spring, so currently, uh, is 95,302 for the system, so that system overall. Um, I can say that Chattahoochee, uh, in which Bobbin teaches, is uh, our largest college. Um, so they have, um, I'm gonna say, about 9,500 students. So they're a, a good chunk of this. And then to give you an idea of how many dual enrollment students we have um, throughout the state, it's almost 24,000 um, for the spring uh, also. So this is, these are both spring of 2019 numbers. Um, so it's almost, it's, it's right at 25% of our entire population um, for all of our colleges uh, is dual enrollment. So we are growing. Um, this actually, we've always had a dual enrollment program of sorts, uh, but a few years ago they, sort of combined some things and the legislature changed the structure of it um, quite substantially. So now any Georgia high school student um, who is eligible and is in grades 9 through 12 um, and is at a participating high school has the opportunity to take, uh, take college classes for college level credit as well as high school credit. 
and so uh, Quill, if you could advance that for me. So um, just to give you an idea, our, our colleges vary uh, in terms of enrollment. So as I mentioned, Chattahoochee is our largest with probably a little over 9,500 students. Um, but we do have a couple of small colleges. So we have some smaller colleges with you know, anywhere from 1,500 students, I think is probably the lowest, um, the lowest student population that any one of our colleges has. Um, but they normally average somewhere between three and seven to 8,000 is a, is a good general idea. So within our 22 colleges, we actually have 13 of them whose dual enrollment population is 20% of more um, of their entire population of those 13. Six are 30 percent or more, um, and then we have two of those who have 40 percent or more um, of their entire student population is dual enrollment. And then one of our colleges actually has a dual enrollment population that is 58 um, percent. I got that number just a couple of weeks ago. So 50, you know, more than half of their entire student population are high school students or college students for us, but um, but they are in the dual enrollment pathway. Um, so that is quite substantial um, for our colleges who just, you know, are having to make these adjustments um, within just a couple of years. Um, these numbers have just skyrocketed for us. Um, they started out pretty strong, you know, at around 12 to 17,000 just um, probably two and a half years ago. Um, and every year in turn, they seem to grow. I think we're finally starting to see them level out a little bit. Um, but, you know, there are definitely some challenges um, with regards to how you teach um, and logistics wise with those, those colleges who are, you know, between the 30 and 50% of their population being high school students. Um, I know that those, those, you know, those colleges have had to, to make some adjustments and, you know, in their student population and how they think about their student population. And so Quill, I'm, I can't, I'm sorry for, there we go, okay. So I just want to give you an idea. I pull these, um, I pull these enrollments regularly because a couple of years ago, um, I have always worked with OER, um, so it's coming up on almost seven years. Um, so we have always had kind of a, a, an OER approach from the system level, um, but a couple of years ago we changed our structure uh, in, in how we are approaching it. And so uh, once dual enrollment or dual enrollment structure um, from, the, um, from the state or the legislature was changed, we started looking at our top dual enrollment courses. And these are our top dual enrollment courses. Uh, these counts are from spring. So, um, of course, the English 1101 and English 1102 numbers are normally swapped for the fall. So if, if I pull these numbers for fall, those two would be reversed. Um, and most likely the history, the two history courses would be reversed. So U.S. History 1 is normally a fall, a heavy fall term uh, course. And then um, U.S. History 2 is, is normally more for the spring by uh, at least a couple hundred. Um, so when we changed our structure, we really started looking at these dual enrollment um, courses uh, and and these these gen ed courses with high dual enrollment populations um, because the way that dual enrollment works for us is um, our students who are coming from the high schools and or faculty going to the high schools are not responsible for the textbook um, so our colleges are responsible to provide those textbooks um, to those students. So now we found the burden uh, of, of the cost of these to be on the college. Um, and, you know, we have colleges who are spending um, hundreds of thousands of their budget to keep up with these, these textbook costs. Um, and in some cases, it's quite astronomical um, for, for some of these large colleges with these high enrollment numbers. Um, so our colleges actually get um, $25 per credit hour um, per term per student. So for the textbook, um, and that is strictly for the textbook. Of course, you know, tuition comes um, along with that. So um, just like any most dual enrollment programs do, but um, but our colleges only get $75. Essentially, if, if you're looking at gen ed courses that are three credit hours, they get you know $75 for a text. Um, which in you know math sciences 
Um, and, and frankly, I've seen, you know, some history and, and site books that run into the two and $300 range. That $75 doesn't go far when you're looking at this many students. Now, this is system-wide. Um, so, you know, it gets broke down amongst 22 colleges, but but these numbers are big. So, um, you know, we really started looking at comparing total enrollment um, to these high uh, dual enrollment courses. And I will say that it's, it's pretty on par. So the top 10 dual enrollment courses are generally within probably three to four course difference in the top 10. Um, they're, our, you know, our top enrollment courses anyway, because everybody has to go through gen ed before they get into their program courses. Um, or at least begin with Gen Ed. So, um, in looking at this, we actually already have, I believe I have seven of these labeled, um, English 1101, Psych 1101, um, poly, uh, Political Science 1101, American Government. Um, we have two history, U.S. history courses, our sociology course, and then most recently we have um, our English 2130. We also have an econ course that's not, that's not in our top 10, but so us at the system office, um, we after we looked at all of these numbers, um, you know, I was essentially pulling faculty from college saying, you know, please work with me, you know, help me build a course. Uh, and we completely changed our approach. So after seeing these numbers um, and the struggles that our faculty were having with, you know, not getting course release time to build a course um, or not getting um, additional compensation or, or really any incentive, um, to try to make an OER course, we decided to start building something that we call foundational courses. So all seven of these, um, we have foundational courses that we developed in the system office, along with usually a handful um, or at least some faculty from the colleges have input and or they completely come aboard and help us build them. Um, a lot of these are OpenStax based because it's easier um, to take those um, take those texts and kind of convert them um, into a course if I don't have a lot of help. Um, so now, you know, our faculty, we're, we're pretty on par with getting um, as many um, courses as we can of our top, um, our top, you know, enrollment courses, dual or otherwise, uh, available for faculty to at least have a, a foundation to start with of a, a show of a course. So we essentially build out the course as a um, minute. Uh, uh, so we, don't, we build out the courses um, to have a, um, basically just a shell and a foundation of, of basic things you would find within the course so that faculty can take it and expand upon it. So uh, we're going to move along um, to the next person. I'm going to let Quill go ahead and take over and then Robin will be able to answer some of your more college related questions for Stan. Okay, thank you so much, Nikki. All right, so we're going to go ahead and move to Heather and Christy. And Christy, we didn't check to see if you made it. Um, so Christy is on as a call and is working on getting the video set up because she is doing it from a high school where one of the challenges is technology um, access and reliability. So she's trying her best. Um, and is everyone able to hear me and see me okay? You're good, Heather, yeah. Okay, great. So if you can just go to the next slide and, uh, and the next one. So we're going to talk about the uh, OER here at Austin Community College, and I'll start by giving you an overview of Austin Community College. Um, we have about 70,000 students annually enrolled, and of those, we have about 7,000, close to 7,000 dual credit students. That includes both dual credit students and also early college high school. Uh, we operate at 11 different campuses. We offer 100 different programs of study and uh, 10 areas of study. And our motto is start here, get there. Um, we serve over six counties in Central Texas and we are certified as a Hispanic serving institution. So for OER and dual credit, uh, 
if you can go one more slide, sorry, thank you. So for OER and dual credit, uh, this last fall in 2018, we offered 56 sections of um, OER in the high schools or in high school classes that are offered at ACC campuses. So we offer dual credit classes, which are um, students who are not in the early college high school program, but are taking college level coursework and they they can take up to 12 courses for free, and then after that, they pay tuition. Early college high school, they are on a degree path um, where the goal is for them to earn an associate's degree at the time they graduate from high school. And those are offered both in the high schools and also on campus, um, either as mixed classes or uh, designated for that specific high school. So in uh, fall of 2018, we had 56 sections that offered dual credit using OER. That included US government, uh, history, US history one and two, uh, effective learning strategies, which is what we're going to focus on today, and introduction to psychology. So that semester alone at the standard $100 per student, that's an estimated savings of $5,600. In this current spring semester, we are offering 62 early college high school dual credit classes using OER. And to the ones listed above, we offered, uh, in addition to those, Composition 2 and Public Speaking. And that is an estimated savings of $6,200 for just this semester. Um, next slide, please. And um, I'm here to specifically talk about the OER we have created and used for our effective learning strategies class which is our kind of introduction to college uh, study skills effective learning class this was developed as uh, part of the achieve the dream grant like many of you uh, participated in um, and I developed the OER along with Laura Lucas who is an adjunct in our student development and general studies department we piloted the OER in the spring of 2017, and it was originally hosted on the Lumen platform, which worked with Achieve the Dream, and that required a Blackboard shell um, or a course uh, shell to be loaded into our Blackboard course, which is our learning management system. Uh, we then made it available to all of our EDUC student development faculty in the fall of 2017. Uh, and then in the summer of 2018, we moved the OER to OER Commons so that it would remain free to students. And this also is a web based, excuse me, a web based platform. So it does not require Blackboard or learning management system to access the OER. Currently, over 50% of all of our EDUC sections use OER, or we call it ZTC, zero textbook cost, here at ACC. The EDUC sections include uh, the three credit hour version, EDUC 1300, which is what most students take, and they're required to take it within uh, their first 12 credit hours. And then we also offer a two credit hour version and a one credit hour version. And then I offer trainings uh, semesterly to faculty on how to use the OER to develop their curriculum in their classroom. And next slide, please. Um, so effective learning is usually the first course that uh, ACC students have to take. It, it is the first course that early college high school students have to take. Dual credit students are not required to take effective learning, but many of them still take it as an elective. One benefit of using the OER for this specific class is that we can include ACC specific content. Uh, so there are direct links in the OER to their area of study advising, to career services, to our library. Um, and this, as I think, especially helps our dual credit students and our early college high school students feel connected to ACC, um, especially if they're taking the class just in their high school. Uh, the OER is interactive. We have embedded web links, quizzes, videos, so it's more than a standard, uh, it's not a PDF, for example, um, or OpenStax. Um, one advantage of using the OER is that it updates immediately. So if um, we offer a new service on campus, I can put that into the OER and it is made available to everyone since it's web-based. Uh, we don't have to reload or recourse copy or, or uh, relink or anything. 
Um, and another advantage is that the OER is available on day one. There's no registration required. They don't need to use Blackboard or learning management system. Um, another advantage is that students have access to the OER after the course has ended since it's a web, a website essentially. And next slide, please. Uh, so specifically in how we're using the OER and effective learning strategies for our dual enrollment in early college high school, um, in the, our department we offered 27 early college high school specific classes and 19 of those this spring semester use the OER. Uh, and that number is increasing um, as the semesters go on. Most sections are taught in um, high schools that are considered low income or low performing. Uh, oftentimes we also bus those students to an ACC campus to take the class on campus. But if the class is offered within the high school, many of the faculty are, uh, are teachers who work at the high school that have a master's degree which qualifies them to teach at ACC. So they are high school math teachers who also teach the effective learning strategies class or high school English teachers, etc. Um, one area of concern, I guess, is that um, all of our faculty are able to pick what they use for their textbook. So right now we have two choices for our EDUC courses. They can use the OER, which is free, or they can use a textbook by Cengage. Um, which is paid for by a student fee and is still relatively low cost. So that means that there isn't necessarily consistency from semester to semester, from high school to high school. So if you have somebody from one of our adjuncts from ACC teaching at Crockett High School, they may choose to use OER. And then the next semester, another faculty may be assigned to teach there and they may choose to use Cengage. Um, one advantage of using the OER for the dual enrollment students is that it's available as a web link that they do, they can access it anywhere from a computer, from a tablet, from their phones or mobile phones. Um, and that oftentimes in the high schools, students are provided with tablets or Chromebooks, or sometimes they have carts that they bring to the classrooms with um, laptops or Chromebooks available for them. And next slide, please. If you can go to the next slide. Oh, that is the next slide. Sorry. Back. Uh, so um, the difference for us is that dual credit students need to pay for their own textbooks. And oftentimes the parents uh, need a payment plan to do that. Um, if you can go back one slide, please. Thank you. But early college high school, the schools, the high schools pay for the textbooks. And they especially would like to reuse the textbook from semester to semester. Uh, but as I said, it's faculty choice. Um, the OER is essentially replacing what's approximately a $50 textbook. But the way we've done it is that uh, we require the students to pay a, a student fee, which covers their textbook, if it's not an OER. That means that the high schools would have to pay that fee every semester if the faculty member chooses to use the Cengage book. If they use OER for those dual enrollment or early college high school classes, then the high schools don't have to pay anything for those textbooks. Um, one challenge we had using a traditional textbook in the high schools is that because we paid for the textbooks with a student fee, faculty received the textbooks, 25 textbooks, and then had to distribute that to our students. And that was often difficult to get the textbooks physically to the high schools, uh, especially if it was a high school teacher who was also an adjunct, they had to figure out how to make it to a campus bookstore when it was open, get the 25 textbooks and bring them back. Um, also, 25 textbooks are remarkably heavy, um, so that's a challenge. Uh, another challenge is that the Cengage textbook does require Blackboard and it requires registering and linking. Um, and that was sometimes a challenge for our high school based adjuncts um, because they had to learn a brand new system. They had to learn Blackboard, how to link uh, the Cengage site to Blackboard, and then they had to teach that to their students. Next slide, please. And I'm going to, is Christy Carr here? Is, are you able to participate, Christy? 
Okay, so I don't know if Christy was able to get on, so I will do my best to um, summarize um, her expertise. Uh, Christy has been teaching dual enrollment classes in the high schools for several semesters, and she has taught not only the EDUC 1300 Effective Learning, uh, but also uh, Comp 1 and Comp 2. So her advice to uh, dual credit uh, instructors who are using OER is to set up a Blackboard site uh, this is especially important for our class because it is the first class that they take here at ACC. So it's important that they learn the learning management system so that because they're going to experience that again in their other courses. Um, and so setting up a Blackboard site that has the OER in, within that and then as well as a gradebook and assignment so they can experience Blackboard. Um, and then she also recommends that class time is used to teach them how to use Blackboard and how to access uh, the materials and the support that's available. But the OER link is also provided outside of Blackboard so that students don't need to enter Blackboard every time they want to access their textbook. It's provided as a web link. And she recommends that you uh, preview that first chapter in class to show them exactly how to access it, how to access the features, the links. Um, there's also a Blackboard app that students can put on their phones. And that is also very helpful, especially in the high schools where many of them have um, smartphones, but they may not have computer access at home. Um, and last slide, I think. Uh, so to date, using OER at Austin Community College uh, with an estimate of $100 per student, we have saved students over $3 million. So that's pretty substantial. And the next slide is our contact information if you would like to reach out if you have additional questions. Thank you so much, Heather, and congratulations on those savings. That's huge. Um, okay, so we have one final presentation today, I think, right? <laughs> um, so, <laughs> and they're sharing a screen, they're both there. Um, so, Peter and Nancy, please take it away. Let me know when to advance slides. Okay, well, uh, hello everyone. I'm Pete Shapiro, Director of Creative Learning Services in the Division of Online and Workforce here at FSCJ. Hi, I'm Nancy Webster, and I'm Executive Director of Articulations for the college. So if we can advance to the next slide, uh, quickly just uh, show you just some overall information about our institution. For those who are not familiar with Jacksonville, we are the largest city in the contiguous 48 states, covering over 800 square miles. Florida State College of Jacksonville covers all of Duval County and Nassau County. Uh, so we are spread out. Uh, even just for a single institution, sometimes we think of ourselves as a system as opposed to a single college. Um, this gives you a, a, a nice overview. Uh, we do have over 150 programs at the institution. And I got involved in this project through OER. So why don't we go ahead to that uh, next slide, please. Um, it was through the Achieving the Dream grant that has, has been uh, described. Um, we completed our AA in general studies. Um, you can see the stats with regards to the courses. I mean, we started from spring of 2017, offering just a couple of sections and serving about 80 students. And through fall, which was the end of our data tracking for the grant, um, we had 187 sections and throughout had saved close to 900,000 in uh, textbook costs. Uh, notice the spring and summer estimate for um, uh, for this year uh, in the midst of spring we will surpass that by a few sections uh, summer is still a question mark but um, you know what we were doing was designing this for online delivery and so we were doing two different things uh, the way that we design our online courses is through a production shop and uh, so we have a faculty uh, subject matter expert working with a team, an instructional designer, a multimedia team, and a librarian. And so our, the content in these courses is quite robust. Um, and sometimes it, it's something that maybe started as OpenStax or started as, uh, as a Lumen Learning course, but then has been added to other sources and then uh, mixed and delivered 
in either a PDF fashion or in a way that uh, uh, students can look at it in an HTML5 format on the web. So uh, anyone can download the content. Uh, but now to get to real important stuff, I'll hand this over to Nancy in our next slide. Thank you, Pete. Uh, I am in charge of the dual enrollment program at the college. And as you can see, it's a very large program. Uh, we have almost 3,000 students each semester. And these dual enrollment students basically uh, are all different flavors of dual enrollment. They are public school students, they are private school students, and we also have a very large homeschool population of dual enrollment students as well, both from, our, from both of our counties. And we offer courses, uh, we offer, some of the students actually come to our campuses, but we offer uh, a lot of uh, classes in the high schools as well. So it's about 12% of our credit enrollment. And what we're offering at the high schools taught by high school credentialed instructors, uh, we had 173 different sections at 42 high schools. And we also offer some of these courses in middle schools as well because we actually have a pre-early college program to prepare students to come into high school and start taking college credit courses. Currently, we're offering 29 different courses on the high school sites, and we have a very high success rate in our program as a whole, about 93%, which is much higher than traditional students. If you can go to the next slide, please. OER has been a real boon to the high schools because in the state of Florida, uh, we are not permitted to charge students, uh, public school students or homeschool students for their textbooks. So if the students are public school dual enrollment students, then it is the school district that must pay for the textbooks. If it is a homeschool student, then the college is responsible for the cost. So both the districts and the college, we were delighted with this option because it uh, is a very uh, significant savings uh, for, for all of us. Private school students do have to pay for their own textbooks, uh, but again, they're very delighted when they have the option of taking an OER course. So we are really trying to expand the OAR use at the high schools, we've actually written it into our dual enrollment articulation agreements that we will offer the OER to the schools for free as long as they can guarantee that they will make sure that the students have access to the technology so that they can utilize those resources effectively. And so this has worked out quite well. And just as a, a single aside, um, I also have the unique situation where I am actually teaching one of these courses as well. So I'm an administrator, but I'm also a faculty member. So I've been teaching the biology for non-majors at one of our high school sites. And my students are delighted that they do not have to, uh, to lug around yet another heavy textbook. And they've been very, very successful in the course of utilizing the OER resources. Thank you. Okay, thank you all so much. And it looks like we have um, about 10 minutes, so not as much time to take questions, but I'm really excited for the opportunity to um, kind of get us all talking with each other about this concept. And I want to start by hearing from some of the faculty on how, um, because I know dual enrollment classes affect teaching in general, but how um, I'm just going to ask this question and I'm going to ask it of all of our faculty presenters today. As an instructor, what were some of your concerns about using OER with dual enrollment students? Um, what did you find out after you started using OER in teaching? Hi, this is Todd. Um, I really, I guess I had no concerns, um, especially when I had first you first OER I used was one that I helped developed as part of a team. So I just looked uh, at our dual enrolled students as just um, any other student who might be in my freshman comp class. Yeah, 
Yeah, I agree with Tom. Um, I don't think I, I don't treat the dual enroll st students any differently than I do regular students. Um, but I guess some of my concerns in the beginning is, you know, I'm old school. I like a textbook. I like have something to refer to. And so um, I think in mentally I had to adjust that I had to make some um, changes and I hope I don't like cover another question here, but I had to um, make sure that um, they had some, if I wanted to use the text, I, they had some device that they could bring the text up. Um, but I also started flipping my classroom a good bit in the terms of they were responsible for reading outside and I made journal assignments. So I would give them questions ahead of time so that they would have to have textual evidence for things um, in before they came to class to talk about that. And they could refer to their that in their journals if they weren't able to bring the text up. So, um, you know, once I adapted to that mentally, um, it, it's fine. I find that actually the dual enroll students, because they are so used to ha using technology on a day to day basis, I mean, they take quizzes on their phones, they do all kinds of things on their phones. So it's really not a transition for them. Um, it's probably more of a transition for, for instructors, I think. Thank you for that, Robin. That's kind of the kind of feedback that's really helpful to have. Um, in particular, because I noticed one of the questions for our colleagues at Florida State at Jacksonville in the chat window, which I have a hard time seeing without advancing the slides in weird ways. Um, so if you see, if you have a question in the chat window you really want to ask, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask it. But I do want to ask this one. Um, I know, are any of our colleges providing print resources, print versions of the OER? Uh, to their students as a way of providing equal access? Um, I know that at ACC, some of our classes, I think government uses OpenStax and provides a PDF. Um, and I think uh, some of our literature classes and Comp 1 classes also offer printed packets. Um, typically what happens is I think it's made available as a PDF and then it is the student's responsibility to incur those printing costs. That's the same way it is at FSCJ. So they have the PDF option and they may print it on their own. And I'll add that that was a concern when, um, or a challenge when we first debuted the OER, is many of our faculty, not just a, a early college high school, but they wanted a hard copy. Um, more for themselves than for the students and um, the OER that we created for effective learning does not lend itself to being printed as a PDF. It has embedded videos, it has embedded activities, um, and you would lose many of those features if you just printed it. And so that was kind of hard to convince faculty that no, there is no hard copy, there's no teacher's edition. Um, and they, they've transitioned, but it was kind of a, a, what? I know students have to get it online, but where's my copy? Uh, and your copy is on the website, just like their copy is. Thank you for mentioning that. And Heather, can you say a few more words? Actually, you talked about professional development that you do every quarter for your yes. faculty who are teaching with the OER. Can you talk a little bit about the kinds of conversations you have in that? Session. Sure. So uh, usually semesterly, since we rolled out um, the OER for effective learning back in 2017, um, that was very new for, um, for what we were doing in our department. And so we started with a training to get everybody up and running. And at that time, it was even a little more complicated because we worked with Lumen. And so that required a course copy from Blackboard in order to get that shell moved over. Um, I also developed material specific for the OER, so the Blackboard site hosts a test bank, PowerPoint slides, um, example handouts, journal entries, those kinds of things. So it was kind of mi of a mix of introducing them to the OER, as well as introducing them to how to use the OER within Blackboard and what resources were available to them as faculty. Um, and I think that was mo many faculty's main concern is that when you're working with the big textbook, textbook companies, they provide a lot of supplemental material, right? You get test banks, you get PowerPoint slides, you get quizzes, activities. Um, and so uh, Laura and I, when we developed the OER, tried very hard to replicate that 
as best that, that we could, although we cannot come up with a thousand question test bank per chapter. Um, so, but we did show them how to use those resources, how to integrate our assignments, which chapters the, those would fall under. Um, but one big advantage was that we were able to listen to faculty. Uh, they would say, how about you put this video in or can you mention this? And because the OER is uh, updated immediately, we were able to imp implement some of those changes. Uh, we did, though, have to also explain to faculty that uh, we are limited in what can go into the OER by Creative Commons licensing. So their favorite video on time management couldn't be put into the OER uh, because it, we had to follow those copyright laws and rules. And so every semester we, we offered a training for faculty that may not have taught with it before or they just want a refresher. Um, and, and it basically outlines how to teach it with the OER. That's a neat idea. Um, Christy, is there anything you want to share about that process? I know that you're at the same institution. Do you do the same with other classes? Oh, we may not have audio for you. Christy, I'm so sorry, we're not hearing you. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to ask another question of all of our institutions because it, it came up in the chat window about um, how faculty go about creating these courses. What are the incentives for them? What are the institutional support services for faculty who, deserve, who design these courses? Uh, I can speak. <coughs> Excuse me, for us, for the very small school, we have quite a, quite a good support system led by um, two particular people, Edie Erickson and Joseph Mould. Um, and being as part of the uh, Achieving the Green, Achieving the Dream grant has been a big help. Uh, basically, any faculty member here can get all the help they want or need um, Edie is uh, she she's a an incredible resource for finding materials, um, collating materials. She's an expert on all the copyright stuff. So, <clears throat> being small in our case definitely has a, an advantage. Uh, no person can ever say that um, they don't have help. I like that line. Go ahead. We also, the Achieve the Dream grant was a big incentive for many faculty uh, because we received a stipend or a release time. Um, I think as an adjunct, you were given a stipend of equivalent to three credit hours. And as full-time faculty, we were given a release time of three credit hours. And so that was a, an incentive for sure. Uh, but that lasted one semester. <laughs> and then, you know, three years later, it, I'm still working on it every day. Um, so for me, the big incentive is the savings to students um, and also um, having the having all students having access to the material day one means that those first couple weeks of class time can actually be used for teaching instead of waiting for the students to get their textbooks. Uh, but we do have institutional support. Our associate vice president, uh, Galen Scott, is very supportive. Um, and Ursula Pike, who I believe is here in the conference, um, is our coordinator of instructional activities. And she also offers a lot of support, as well as our head librarian, Carrie Gitz. I just wanted to chime in on the sustainability. And, and again, going back to the grant, um, the grant just basically gave us the opportunity to take what we already had in place for our online courses and just extend it to OER. Uh, we really wanted to have one model that we use, a sustainability model of you know, uh, giving a stipend for a faculty member who's going to develop a master course. Uh, that course would then be revised anywhere between 18 and 36 months after it's created based on the content area, based on how much might change or might need to be improved. Once again, a stipend would be used based on the work needed. Uh, it's something that the Center for E-Learning has been doing for some time, and it just made sense, I know, to Nancy when she started inquiring about 
hey, what have you guys done? What can we apply to the high schools that we're already doing here at the institution? And it was just a natural. Thank you for that. Yes. And I, I think um, as a college that has that ATD grant, I'll chime in here and say it's really, really helpful, but then you have to consider con sustainability and how you keep that work ahead of you. So I'm looking at the time and I want to make sure to get in the CCC announcement, OER announcements briefly before we can return to the conversation because I know folks are about to lose their hour. So um, I just want to mention that the CCC OER website um, has wonderful information, including ways to get involved in our community. We are looking for officers right now for next year. So if you're at all interested in participating at that level, please visit our website and get in, in touch with me via email. I will put my email in the chat window link. Um, towards the end of the webinar. Um, but please visit our website, cccoer.org. And if you go into the top right button about our community, you can find things like our list of upcoming conferences where we list OER conferences that are coming up and links to our community email so that you can join our email list if you're not there already. Um, we do these webinars monthly during the school year, so um, we have two more coming up. We have one on May 8th on ZTC, OER and ZTC degree pathways, so um, we will be hearing from some wonderful folks in California, Minnesota, and New York. Um, as you can see in front of you. Uh, several of our presenters today mentioned the OER degree initiative and that's part of the um, OER degree pathway work. Um, and then on June 5th, we're gonna have regional models for OER implementation because there seems to be a fair amount of work in the regional space around OER. So we're really, really excited to have two more webinars of this academic year and we're hopeful that you will join us at them. Um, Okay, so here is contact information for um, Una, um, myself, and Liz. We are all great fonts of information in terms of finding out more about CCC OER. But I want to give, we still have three minutes left of our webinar, so it's a chance for folks to um, chime in on things that they didn't get a chance to talk about um, or answer questions they see in the chat window that they like. So I want to turn this time over to our presenters and in particular, Robin, we didn't get a chance to hear from you. Would you like to chime in briefly? Yes, um, one thing that I wanted to say is just far as um, resources is that um, I have become best friends with our librarians and one of the most helpful things um, on our campuses is they have hosted what they call OER boot camps. And um, so for example, the first one last May, we spent, you know, between the semester breaks, like three days where we went and we were able, um, faculty members were able to sit there in the classroom with librarians and so what that did i it like in three days it helped me to almost completely build an american lit course um, because i was able to go through I, the things that i couldn't find i could um, refer to a librarian and they they were there to help me research that um, and so for example i even had one example with um there was something that i found um, in american lit and i really wanted to use this and i couldn't find where you know there are any permissions for that and so one of our li librarians I just handed it over to her she emailed the um, museum that that document came from and got permission for me <laughs> and so to be able to use that resource so I cannot um, sing the praises enough about our librarians um, and they they continually are, are just eager to help us um, also one in particular, one of our librarians has set up a special link on our library website that is just a collection of OER materials by subject, and she's continually adding to that. And so um, that is huge, um, just to be able to go there because they can find things that we can't, because that's their job. <laughs> I love that idea of the OER boot camp, and now I want to have one. <laughs> I think that's brilliant. <laughs> um, okay, and I always, I always love when the last word is about librarians. But if anybody would like to chime in one more thing, I would love to hear from you. We have one minute left of our day. 
Uh, Quill, there was a great question from Jackie about um, adult learners 35 and up, and maybe they might have some difficulty that the younger students wouldn't have with accessing digital materials. And I wondered if one of the faculty or administrators would like to take that on. Um, I can speak to that here at ACC. Uh, a lot of my students are con considered non-traditional um, veterans, um, returning back to the workforce. Um, I've had students as old as 85. Um, so uh, I think um, initially they are a little um, intimidated by having their textbook online, but I think that it is easier for them to navigate the OER that is hosted on OER Commons than it is for them to navigate Blackboard, uh, which they have to learn how to do anyway. Um, so yes, they are a little intimidated, um, some of them, not all of them, but some are a little intimidated about the technology that is required of them now as a college student. Uh, but technology is now required of them as a college student. And so using technology to teach effective learning strategies is a good way to onboard them to the technology they'll need to be successful in community college here at ACC and also if they transfer or if they go directly into the workforce. Thank you so much, Heather. Okay, so I wanna thank you all for participating in our webinar today. I really am grateful that people wanna talk about this dual enrollment question um, because I think it's an ongoing concern and I know it's one that's big in my institution. And thank you again for participating in our webinars. Um, we can take a couple more questions if people are willing to hang out, um, but as of right now, I'm formally ending the formal part of the webinar. Thank you all. <laughs>